Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another story time for our tabletop RPG for Star Wars. So we're going to continue the way that I've been doing it, or at least, at least the, the way that I told the story last time, which is more of a uh, discussionary storytelling than a narrative storytelling, and that's fine, but we're going to keep doing it until we catch up to our current play session. So maybe one or two more uh, story times until we, we finally caught up because we've got to talk about everything that's happening on Dathomir and they've spent several weeks there so it might uh, it might take two two more videos to get through that but in this one we're really just going to focus on the events leading up to Dathomir and again if you you know like the old way of doing it compared to the new way let me know and we will kind of figure out uh, from there but we are going to continue this way up until we catch up uh, with our current game, and then we'll decide from there. But the last time we left our players, they were back on Ord Mantell, and they had just pretty much gone through a lot of uh, narrative storytelling with, you know, figuring out things about different characters. Cookie learned about his his father. We had the rest of uh, the players kind of learn about who Caitlin was, who to them was just a secretary until that point, and learned that her sister, uh, Lily, had been pretty much captured uh, on the planet of Dathomir at that, you know, that, that Cookie's father was also on Dathomir. So there was clearly something going on there and they wanted to kind of get to the bottom of these murders happening on, on Ord Mantell that were primarily their bounty targets, uh, the, the murder targets that is. But what ends up happening is they kind of get stonewalled by the leadership on Ord Mantell and they unknowingly and unwittingly put uh, one of the leaders really on the sights for taking over the entire the entire Shadow Collective, which is uh, bad for them. But, you know, that's that's the way that it crumbled. So with that lead up, they then went back to Vex, who had their next bounty. you got to remember, they're doing the, the Great Hunt. They're trying to win the Great Hunt, uh, mostly because Gand, the bounty hunter, will... It's his whole like priority in life right now is to make a name for himself. Literally, in the Gand culture, they have no names until they do something of importance and then they earn their name. So the Gand, as in the, the race of people, and then Gand, the person, so Gand, our bounty hunter, uh, he needs to... He needs to get a name, so he's the, the way he sees doing that is doing the the great hunt. So that's kind of what they're doing now. They finally have the next target in the next stage of the competition. We're actually nearing the end of the competition at this point. Not quite there yet, but we are nearing the end. And Vex straight up, you know, says like, "Hey, you guys gotta go to Coruscant this time." This is the first time the players have gone to the inner core, the inner rim, you might say, uh, of the galaxy. And this is definitely the first time they've had the, uh, really the impetus to go to Coruscant to begin with, even though all the players know what Coruscant is and their characters obviously know what Coruscant is and how it, how it runs and everything. But they've lived on the Outer Rim most of their lives, so going to Coruscant is uh, kind of a cool little deal for them. Their bounty target is a man named Wolf Diedrich, who uh, they find out uh, on their way there. They get in their ship, they start you know heading there, and and by the way, this is something that I've mentioned before, but isn't really shown in the Star Wars movies or any media that you consume. But uh, sometimes in the books, you'll, you'll get a bit of this. The way that ships travel throughout the galaxy, it's not as quick travel as the movies would lead you to believe. Traveling from Ord Mantell to Coruscant actually takes a few days. Uh, traveling from Tatooine, which is on one side of the galaxy, up to Ord Mantell takes like a week. Uh, so there is a lot of time that has to pass during these uh, hyperspace jumps. And in the movies and in the TV show and everything, you don't you don't catch that. But in the books, sometimes, it, like I said, it alludes to it. So they're on the, sh the ship for a couple days here on their way to Coruscant. So they have time to kind of uh, do their thing, which is to investigate who this guy is and figure out the best way to bring him in because as the rules of the great hunt state they don't they don't give you any information they give you the target and where they're located and then from there it, uh, it it's up to you which i think is a fun way to give the players a lot of freedom in how they go about doing it 
Now, I also need to be able to be prepared for that kind of thing, and I, I was, and we'll get to that in a second, but on the way there, they find out that uh, Wolf is a, a thermal dynamicist, and for whatever reason, he has a bounty on his head. Like, that's that's how this happens. They don't, they don't care why he has the bounty. They only care that he has the bounty. Uh, so he's an engineer, a thermi- thermal dynamicist engineer within the galaxy. And he is pretty well known, apparently, for saving Mustafar, which is the planet at the end of uh, Episode 3, The Revenge of the Sith, where Obi-Wan and, and uh, Anakin are fighting each other. That that planet with all the lava and everything. So he saved the planet recently, and this is all stuff that I made up, but actually works within the, the universe. He saved the planet recently from uh, destabilization. In the, in the planet core, because the planet is mostly molten. And uh, he basically came up with a, a way to harness the geothermic activity in the planet uh, and store that power rather than having it unleash itself on itself, um, which is would be bad and would cause the planet to blow up over the course of you know a period of, of years. So he came up with this way to, to store that thermal energy and because of that uh, he became well known within the galaxy as a thermal dynamicist with that being known they the party was able to kind of track him down where he would be on the planet the the main point to this is that they can uh, go to a place that again that i made up on coruscant but would make sense to be there which is a scientific society which is like where a ton of different scientists not just thermal dynamicists but you know also people who might investigate uh hyperspace or investigate weaponry or investigate you know biology and stuff like that within the galaxy they probably would congrue and come together in a you know specific parts of the galaxy so coruscant being a very wealthy planet you could assume that there is a scientific society there for them to come to and hang out so the players send a few of their uh people over to the scientific society upon getting there Uh, some of their you know more inconspicuous people uh to basically ask where they might find this guy so they go there, they find a woman named uh, Clara, who is the, the secretary of this place. And it's just kind of like taking calls. And it's a large, like extravagant building because they, they host many events there and everything. But the players come in and are basically trying to deceive this person into thinking that they're just interested also in thermal dynamicists or in, in thermal dynamics. And uh, they do a good job of it. And they learn that they basically have three avenues to go to. And this is what I was saying is, and I, I also need to prepare for what the players could do. So I gave them basically three ways of going about this. Um, they have freedom within those three ways, of course, but that way I could actually like prepare maps ahead of time. And this was at the end of a session that I gave them these options. So that way that week I can kind of come up with stuff, just a little GM trick. So, they could either go to uh, his university that he currently teaches twice a week at, and that would be kind of later in the week that they could do that. They could go to his home, which he, because, you know, saving a planet apparently makes you a lot of money. So he has a space yacht uh, up in the uh, pretty much the outer reaches of, of Coruscant. So if they wanted to go up there, that is also an option. But then there was also a masquerade ball happening the next day, which is a uh, it's basically a, a celebration of the pursuit of science within the galaxy. And it was uh, it's a masquerade that's a yearly thing that they, they learned and that they could go there and potentially find him there because he was invited so he possibly was there now the thing to keep in mind is that the players uh are on a time constraint they are not only doing this bounty they are competing against another bounty hunter who is also trying to bring in this uh, person so they know that whatever the fastest option is is probably going to be the one that would help them uh that being said they also know that generally speaking the easiest one to do could also be the one to go for because they have a lot less risk involved in that they decided to go the quick option and go to the 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 masquerade so we ended our session there we came back i had all these stuff prepared for it and they had a lot of different options to get there um, as you hear me 
flip my actual notes because I have a notebook. I keep I keep notes in a notebook. It's how I do. It's it actually makes it a lot easier as a GM to uh, to have all this stuff written down. It's making it so I can actually remember it. But they went there uh, to the the basically the area that it was at, and this is it's what it was is it was a ballroom on the top of this massive building. So like you know thousands of stories up because Coruscant has like a huge underbelly and everything. But this building in particular at the top has this crazy glass structure that the scientific society rents out. It's a, it's more of a an area just for events to happen. But they went uh, They went to it because the ball was going to happen there. The masquerade was going to happen there. And they learned from uh, Clara, the woman, that, you know, masks and stuff would be provided. But the players would have to get an invitation. They wouldn't be able to get in otherwise. So they had a, a few different options. They could, like, try to go in as, like, catering staff, right? Like, that's an option. They could just try sneaking in straight up, like, finding a way in and sneaking in. They could try to get an invite somehow, um, which is kind of the route they took, except they they went a different direction with it, which is they wanted to forge their own invitations. Now, the way invitations work, it's not like a piece of paper in the Star Wars universe. They have technology. So it's more like a like a key card kind of thing that you would get. And then that they, they scan it on the way in just to make sure that you're authorized to be there. And the players, uh, and this is really important to note, is the person who is Alex playing uh, Venator, our droid, was not going to be able to be there that week, but we decided to play anyways. So it's unfortunate for him. He missed a really cool moment. His character is kind of more about the computers checks and stuff. So he went and did a really good computers check and I rolled for him and he like double triumphed. He, he double crit on his roll and... Basically, with that, we we managed to make, you know, multiple personalities for these players that are going in uh, that actually, like, make sense. And, and not only that, but because he double crit, they weren't just, like, made up personalities. He's managed to, like, plant a lot of information there where his all these the players here have uh, these personalities that are technically now existing in the universe so some people may now recognize these players as these people that are completely made up because of the result of this role so on that front they're good to go they can get into the party uh their their masks will be provided to them and and as they land they drop off all but one of the players uh venator being the person who wasn't there decided and and the, the i had the party decide this for him to stay in the ship um so that way, and their reasoning was that they want an easy escape route if they needed it. But they land on this landing pad. They drop off all the players. Players come out. They're nicely dressed in the stuff that they got to wear to the recent ball at uh, on Ord Mantell, which was cool that we could kind of you know utilize that stuff. Um, but then they they come in. They realize there's a ton of guards everywhere. They're not necessarily armed, but the guards looked like more of a you know, like a like a like a marine ball would in the U.S., like where you have these people who are part of the military show up for like their own special event, and they dress up in like these really nice uh, outfits and everything that are you know militaristic in nature. They were there as more of a formality, just being like, yes, the the government on Coruscant definitely supports this kind of stuff. So they they were there as you know guards, but also as you know being there for I guess posterity stake. Now, what ends up happening is the players move through, they get in line, they're waiting, and they get a, uh, they, they get like the little masks after getting through security, no problem, because it's their really cool role. And the masks are basically a necklace they put on, and then it projects a mask over their face, and it fits whatever, you know, race they are. So you, you, they've noticed that there are people of different races here. So because you have to have, uh, this mask on suddenly it's a lot harder for them to find wolf diedrich they don't know necessarily what he looks like uh they know that he is a, an older gentleman and they have to basically go on the hollow net and find a picture of him but even then it's not really going to help much uh, even if they had a rough description of him there's so many people here wearing different masks it was hard to find so they end up going inside kind of like you know feeling it out looking around the the day before they actually went and scouted it out uh, as and they they're 
their cover was that they were uh, making sure that the place was secure and the catering staff was walking in and out. So on the day before, their bounty hunter went in knowing that he wouldn't be able to bring weapons in on the day of and hid a knife inside uh, inside the area. So when they're scouting around now, now that it's actually the masquerade happening, our bounty hunter goes to recover his weapon, knowing that he wouldn't have been able to bring any in. And one of the he goes there, he looks for it, and he can't find it. And he realized one of the catering staff is actually using it as a as like a a knife to cut food. And they do this whole little uh, thing where they they say like, oh hey, that th- the food on the other side of the room. They t- they said that you needed to go over there and help with that, and they made a good deception check, and the guy leaves, but uh, leaves the knife there, and the players pick up the knife. So now they're armed, they're kind of ready to go, uh, but our smuggler manages to also bring in a- an additional weapon because. That's what he does. He's a smuggler. So he hides a weapon on the way in and he has a pistol with them. So they have a pistol and a knife and they are now scouring the area trying to find this bounty. The other thing is they are looking out for another bounty hunter, someone who looks suspicious. They do come across a woman who is uh, talking to, you know, another scientific woman there. But the woman that they noticed isn't really interested in the conversation that they walk by on. And she seems distant and kind of looking around and keeping an eye on everything. And they kind of mark this woman as potentially the bounty hunter. Fortunately, they were right. And it's a Natulian woman named Rahi that they later find out. But she is also kind of looking around trying to scout this guy out. The players, still having not found their bounty, decide to try to lure this woman or try to uh, capture her and knock her out and make it so she, that that whole thing is out of the picture and then they have plenty of time to find their bounty so they go upstairs like an, a really elegant ballroom stairs to this balcony that kind of overlooks one of the ballrooms and they kind of wait around a corner knowing that she was likely to come up at some point so they wait for her and as as she comes up they they don't they they lose her she kind of disappears and she turns the corner and bumps into the players all of a sudden and they're surprised she's surprised she realizes wait why like these people are really suspicious and then she puts two and two together and realizes oh that's the other bounty hunters so she tries to lie her way out of it and be like oh i was looking i was looking for the bathroom and she kind of like backs up and is like trying to get away and that's when our smuggler uh alask pulls his gun on her and she pulls out a whip and whips the gun out of his hand, and the gun falls onto the floor. And it's this moment where the gun is on, or in between the two of them, they're about 10 feet apart, and all of the upstairs here is pretty empty. So everybody on this little balcony area is mostly just the players. There's like a a guy or two at the far end, but they are not noticing what happened yet. And everybody down below, there's too much like, chatter going on there's a lot of people like in the ballroom they they don't see this happening so alask goes for the gun but ray he goes for it at the same time so alask actually wins the role here they made a, a little athletics role and he kicks the gun or picks it up and tosses it over to doc because doc was the closest player but six pounder the guy who plays doc just knows his character so well his character is a huge klutz doesn't quite work well under pressure and so he tosses this gun at him and doc catches the gun and then fumbles it like he literally he didn't roll or anything he was like yeah i catch it and then i just drop it because that's how i am i just i couldn't in the pressure of the moment wouldn't be able to carry it and it created this funny moment where al asks just like face palms like how could you like come on man like that was we needed that and there's a tussle between al ask and rahi Reiki being a lot more physical, her kind of thing, she has this pneumonic whip, pneumonic? Pneumonic whip, uh, which is uh, an item that was actually added in the huts of uh, Nalhada, or or the the gangs of Nalhada. It's it's one of the books I have. Let me look at it here, because it's on the other side. The Lords of Nalhada. Got it. Um, And it's this really cool little weapon. But she, that's what she uses. So she's more of a physical like fighter who likes to be stealthy. And uh, the tussle doesn't go well for her. They end up hitting her in the face and not knocking her out yet, but making it look like, you know, th- like they had the upper hand. So they kind of take a hold of her 
and they knew about a like a storage room that was close by that they had scouted out earlier. So they they get a hold of her and they start dragging her over to the storage room. And as they open the door and the players move in, there are two guys just standing there near the balcony. And they turn around and see this happening. And that's that's when Reiki yells, help, like, help me. And then the door shuts all of a sudden as they, they go inside. They then pull out the gun, put it to stun, and try to knock her out. They assume that they do because she... Looks like she falls unconscious. Little did the players know she is a really good liar. So she was faking that she was knocked out. The door swings open as one of the guys from the outside looks in and is trying to figure out what the heck is going on. This like he's a scientist. It's not what it's, this, this thing is very interesting and weird that's happening. And as the, the door swings open, the players look and see him. They realize oh crap, he matches this, the description. And they kind of like look beyond his mask as one of the players is kind of off to the side and realizes that's actually him. So then they knock him out. They pull him into the room. They shut the door. There's another guy on the outside like, like what the heck just happened? So now he's going to get help. And the players realize they, they have a ticking time bomb on their hands. So they call up a wax or, or Venator, as he's now known, uh, his, their droid on the ship. And he brings the ship over and just because the entire roof here is like this glass structure, he just kind of brings it down on the corner of the, the building here where they're at and makes a hole in the glass uh, enough to go and open up the, uh, the little like ramp that leads into their ship which their ship is a YT-1300, which is basically a Millennium Falcon. So they bring down the ramp through the little window, broken. Uh, the the droid, Venator, throws a rope down, brings everybody up. Uh, but at this point, it's almost time to go. Like, people are actually able to break into this door at this point. They bring everybody up. They get Wolf in the ship. They get Reiki into the ship. And they take her. And she was, at this time, as they're bringing her up, she realizes now is my chance she tries to break away she tries to get away and uh, as she's doing so the the players finally then are managed to knock her out bring her inside the ship and they put her in the carbonite chamber instead of the bounty they put her in the carbonite chamber and on their way back to ord mantel after this funny little tussle where it almost really went bad for them but they managed to do it because of some really funny roles uh they talk to wolf and they interrogate him. They're like, why do why do you have a bounty on your head? What, like, what is going on? And he's scared. He's a scientist. This isn't his thing. He doesn't know. He has literally no idea why he has a bounty on his head and why people want him uh, to be brought in. So the players are assuming at this point that whatever has happened, whoever is issuing these bounties for the Great Hunt and whoever's murdering these people when they bring them in, something weird is going on. And for whatever reason, they want this scientist who apparently has no uh criminal history unlike all the other people that they brought in so they devise a plan to put a tracker on this guy and the guy agrees because he doesn't want to die they explain the situation to him um but they bring him in they land back on the planet and they hand the guy over and then they let reiki go they they just are really kind to her knowing that in this competition she'll drop into the lower bracket and if she manages to fight her way back through and get back to the finals of the the great hunt then maybe they might find some mercy from her at some point on that that final one because they let her go and didn't kill her which is actually allowed uh, on the same bounty if you're if you're fighting for the same bounty in the the rules that says that you could kill the other person but so far they haven't done that and they kind of wanted to keep that up but they let her go and with that we ended that session and it was it was a lot of fun but now they don't have a bounty for a while. Vex straight, straight up tells him, like, you guys actually have a little bit of time here to go and do other things if you would like to. Now they have their moment. They have their opportunity to go to Dathomir and try to investigate further about what's going on. As far as they know, though, their bounty from the tracker is still on planet. He it isn't dead yet because it's moving around as far as they know. So they're going to try to keep an eye on that. Um but yeah, that, that was the end of the session. That's where we're end this storytelling 
for now. When we get to Dathomir, it'll probably be broken into two parts because some pretty interesting things happened on Dathomir, and they learned a bit more information. Um, but before heading to Dathomir, they went and did a little bit of more investigation on the planet, which we'll talk about when we get to the Dathomir episode next because it it relates. Um, but with all of that being said, let me know if you like this way of storytelling better than the other, just like before. Um, and we shall see you guys next time.